the hare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the hare by francis c woodworth from stories about animals with pictures to match librivox coffee break collection number 8 Probably most of my readers are so well acquainted with natural history that they do not need to be told that the hare and the rabbit are very like in their appearance as well as in most of their habits. The two animals, however, are sufficiently unlike to be entitled to a separate introduction in our stories. Hares have been known to possess a good deal of cunning, which is a fortunate circumstance for them, as they often need not a little of this trait of character in their numerous persecutions. I have seen, says Dufourieu, a French naturalist, a hare so cunning that as soon as it heard the huntsman's horn, it started from its place, and though the distance of a quarter of a league from it, leaped to a pond, and there hid itself among the rushes, thus escaping the pursuit of the dogs. I have seen a hare which, after having run above two hours before the dogs, has dislodged another hare, and taken possession of its residence. I have seen them swim over three ponds, of which the smallest was not less than eighty paces broad. I have seen others, which, after having been warmly chased for two hours, have entered a sheep cot through the little opening under the door, and remained among the cattle. Others again, when the dogs have chased them, have joined a flock of sheep in the field, and, in like manner, remained with them. I have seen others, which, when they heard the dogs, have have concealed themselves in the earth or have gone along on one side of a hedge and returned by the other so that there was only the thickness of the hedge between the dogs and the hare i have seen others which after they have been chased for half an hour have mounted an old wall of six feet high and taken refuge in a hole covered with ivy an english hunter tells a very affecting anecdote about two hares which were chased by a pack of dogs a hare which they had pursued for some time was nearly exhausted on the way he came across another hare doubtless a personal friend of his the latter after a short conversation with the former for there was not time for many ceremonies took the place of the poor weary one and allowed himself to be chased by the dogs while the other who must soon have fallen a victim to the dogs was left to shift as best he could and to find a place of shelter the hares in Liberia exhibit much foresight. In the month of August, they cut great quantities of soft, tender grass and other herbs, which they spread out to dry. This hay, early in autumn, they collect into heaps and place either beneath the overhanging rocks or about the trunks of trees, in conical heaps of various sizes, resembling the stacks in which men sometimes preserve their hay in winter. These stacks, which the hares make, are much smaller, however, not usually more than three feet high. In the winter, these stacks are covered with snow, and the animals make a path between them and their holes. They select the best of vegetables for their winter store, and crop them when in the fullest vigor, and these they make into the best and greenest hay. Dr. Tosen, while in Gottingen, succeeded in getting a young hare so tame that it would play about his sofa and bed. It would leap upon his knee, pat him with his forefeet, and frequently, while he was reading, it would jump up in his lap and knock the book out of his hand, so as to get a share of his attention. One Sunday evening five men were sitting on the bank of the River Mersey in England, singing sacred songs. The field where they were had a forest on one side. As they were singing, a hare came out of this forest and ran toward the place where they were seated. As she came up very near the spot, she suddenly stopped and stood still for a considerable time, appearing to enjoy the sound of the music. She frequently turned her head, as if listening with intense interest. When they stopped singing, she turned slowly toward the forest. She had nearly reached the forest when the gentleman commenced singing again. The hare turned around and ran back swiftly, nearly to the spot where she had stood before and listened with the same apparent pleasure until the music was finished then she again retired towards the woods and soon disappeared 
Cooper was a great lover of pets, and I confess that I love him for this trait of his character. He has endeared himself to me, indeed, as much by the kindness he showed to the different animals which he had about him, and which he had taught to love him, as by almost any other act of his. I never think of Cooper without thinking, too, of the interest he took in everything that breathed, and I hardly ever see a pet hare, or rabbit, or squirrel, without thinking of him. If the reader is as much interested in the poet as I am, he will like to see a portrait of him which I introduce in this connection. Many people take great delight in hunting such beautiful and innocent animals as the fawn and the hare, but Cooper was no sportsman. He could not bear to hurt anything that lived. You remember, perhaps, that he says in his task about being kind to animals. Let me see if I can quote it from memory. I guess I can, for I learned it at school when a little boy, and those things are always fixed in the memory more indelibly than those which are learned in maturer years. I think, he says, I would not enter on my list of friends, though graced and polished manners and fine sense, yet wanting sensibility, the man who needlessly sets foot upon a worm, an inadvertent step may crush the snail that crawls at eve along the public path, but he who has humanity forewarned will step aside and let the reptile live. He was right. The kind-hearted poet was right. Well, as I said before, he was not only careful about giving pain to animals, but he was very fond of pets. First and last he had a good many of these pets, but there were none of them that he took so great delight in as his hares. He had two of these pretty little creatures, and they seemed to be as fond of him as he was of them. Cooper was subject to fits of great despondency or depression of spirits. With him hypochondria was a sort of chronic disease. He would try to be cheerful. He knew the nature of his melancholy, and often tried to remedy indirectly what could not be reached directly. He resorted to innocent amusements in order to lead the mind away from the contemplation of its own ills, real or imaginary. This was well, it was philosophical, but it did not always succeed. The disease was too deeply seated in his system. The care which he took of his pets was no doubt one of his favourite amusements. These hares, there were three of them at first, though one of them did not live long, had each very different characters. The poet described them in detail in one of his letters. Puss was the greatest favourite. He was more tractable, tame, and affectionate than the rest. Once the fellow was very sick, and his master treated him with a great deal of kindness, gave him medicine, and nursed him so well that he recovered. Cooper says that Puss showed his gratitude by licking his hand for a long time, a ceremony he never went through with but once in his life, before or afterward. Bess, who died young, was the funny one. He had a great fund of humour and drollery. Tiny, though very entertaining in his way, seems to have been rather a grave and surly fellow. When he died, and he lived to a good old age, some nine years, I think, Cooper buried him with honour, and wrote an epitaph for him. I will copy two or three stanzas from this epitaph to show that Tiny got quite as good a character as he deserved. Epitaph on a Hare here lies whom hound did ne'er pursue, nor swifter greyhound follow, whose feet ne'er tainted morning dew, nor ear heard huntsman's hallow. O tiniest, surliest of his kind, who nursed with tender care, and to domestic bounds confined, was still a wild jack hare. Though duly from my hand he took his pittance every night, he did it with a jealous look, and when he could, would bite. I kept him for his humour's sake, for he would oft beguile my heart of thought that made it ache and forced me to a smile. And now beneath this walnut shade he finds his long last home and waits in snug concealment laid till gentler puss shall come. He, still more aged, feels the shocks from which no power can save, and partner once of Tiny's box must soon partake his grave. End of The Hare by Francis C. Woodworth